Hello. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Eating Hello. my breakfast. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Three after. Um, I don't think there's any AIs, AIs worth calling out uh, other than, although Kathy did do her PR for the thing. It was merged. So thank you, Kathy. Um, okay. So the face-to-face -face meeting. Last time I checked in the doodle poll or the face-to-face -face meeting for Shanghai, um, only six people said they're going to be there. And we never actually agreed on what the formal number would be for a quorum for a formal meeting, but I think six is a little low given that we have, I think, 17 or 16 voting companies. Six definitely feels low. So we'll work on defining what the actual number should be, but I think six is too low for us. Um, however, I did want to ask the question if anybody disagreed with that assessment. Okay, not hearing any. So of those six people, I, I am going to reach out to you guys to see who is interested in participating in the intro and deep dive sessions and who wants to present and all that other stuff. So I'll take those conversations offline, work with you guys. Um, the material that we present, I assume we will pr produce it in a way that will be available to the working group at large uh, to participate in putting it together. But uh, I assume of those six people, um, we'll find the presenters uh, to, to actually do the thing. All right, um, and as I just want to point out, there is a brainstorming doc that I created to gather ideas for the next possible interop. Now, whether we do that at Shanghai or Seattle or some other event is still TBD, um, but I did want to start getting some brainstorming going. So if you guys get a chance, please do look at that document and put some ideas down there uh, for things we can start considering, okay? Are there any other questions, comments, or anything related to potential face-to-face -face meetings that people want to bring up? All right, not hearing any, moving forward then. Is there any community related topics? This is just a short time for people who don't normally join the phone call, but are from the broader community for issues that they'd like to bring up for consideration by the group. All right, not hearing any, moving forward then. I don't believe Austin's on the call. Um, and I don't think anything's happened with the SDK work other than I think Austin, it will plan on or is planning on setting up another call now that the extension discussion is, is behind us. Uh, so look for an invite coming up fairly soon. I'll ping Austin offline to make sure that happens. Um, Kathy, I don't believe there's anything, or I guess I should ask, is there anything you wanna mention relative to the workflow group other than your PR has been merged? Um, no, yeah, not really. So after that PR merge, people can start uh, pulling new PRs to modify it, to make it better. So that's the whole point. That's that currently that uh, draft is just a starting point, which the work, workflow subgroup has worked on and uh, reached a consensus. But that's just a starting point. So uh, I hope you know more people could join, and then you know to evolve this document to yep. make it better. Yep, sounds good. And so, Kathy, what what is your plan or desire relative to? Uh, moving forward on the document. Do you want all work to be done through through PRs or do you still want to have some sort of regular phone calls to discuss things that go on in the, in the document? So I, I think, uh, you know, um, the work will be, the new change will be committed through PR, but if there is, uh, you know, um, how to say it, if there is a topic that needs, you know, more, um, um, uh, Meeting this that needs meeting discussion to um, to to move it forward. Uh, I think you know we can call a, a meeting um, as needed. That that's I'm not sure what was other people's thought. Okay, what do the people think? Are, are people okay with pretty much doing everything through PRs and then having one-off phone calls as as the need arises? Is that okay with people? Yeah, I think that makes sense. We've had quite a lot of phone calls. So at this point, going through PRs and then having calls as needed would probably make sense. Okay, sounds good. Any other comments on that one? All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Kathy. I think that ends that one. Thank you. So people, please uh, go look at the documents um, and submit PRs moving forward. All right, jumping into, I don't think we have any maintenance issues to discuss, so we can jump right into some of the PRs. Sarah, are you on the call? I don't think I see Sarah. Okay, so I can take this one. Unless, Rachel, you want to talk to it. Yeah, we can, we, I'm happy to talk through this one. Okay. The, the proposed change here is that we should uh, 
take offline voting to be the norm. So instead of doing the roll call vote, we would just say this is up for a vote and you have however long to go in and vote on the, on the comment, with a comment. So just to be, just for my understanding to be clear, for some PRs, we don't actually do a formal vote. It's, is there any objection to adopting it? This doesn't impact that. It's, right. So whether there's unanimous consent, we can just let it go through. It's only for, for lack of a better phrase, contentious PRs that causes us to do a formal vote. We're just putting down into words what we've kind of been doing all along, right? Yeah, yeah. The idea is that we wouldn't have to do the long roll call where we call everyone's name and wait for it. Right. Okay. I believe this was out there since Tuesday or so, so I don't think they made major changes. Um, any questions or comments on this one? I have a question. So is this like majority vote? Like, for example, if, if a PR, you know, people vote differently. So how we this make the decision? Yeah, so, so where is it? In here, it talks about... There is somewhere in here where it talks about it's a majority vote, a majority of people who vote. Um, I know it's in here someplace. Oh, I sorry. A vote passes if more than fifty percent of the oh, votes there cast. Go. The motion. Okay, got it. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't know why I couldn't see that thing, but thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments on this one? Okay. Any objection to adopting it then? All right, not hearing any. Thank you, Rachel, for walking through that one. All right, Kathy, correlation discussion. Um, you want to share your screen, right? So let me just stop sharing. Yeah, okay, let me share. Okay, okay there you go. Hold on just a second. Um, could people see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go through this um so I, i'm going to go through some uh use cases um that you know shows well, why we need uh um, some identity labels or attributes um for the correlation um purpose and so the first use case is a home security use case um of course you know in order to illustrate the uh, the issue uh, the use case have been simplified. The real use case could be more complicated than this. So as shown in the um, following burglary detection example, a home monitoring application uh, involves two events, or it could be more events, but this example just shows it involves two events, a motion event, which means they detect a motion, and, and the door or window open event. Since there are many homes, and then there will be many old motion events and window open events from these homes. So the event consumer needs to map each event to the correct home security application instance. As shown in the diagram, the right side, you know, I have multiple yellow blocks that shows this instance. And then on the left side, we can see there are two types of event source or event types. And then the event A represent the motion event, event B represent the window open event. And then it could go through some intermediate routing system uh, or gateway and then reach the event consumer. So when the event consumer receives this event, it needs to know, okay, which um, event A, um, uh, okay, so that event should be delivered to which instance. Basically, it needs to correlate um, the event A and event B correctly. So if it's like, you know, um, sent, you know, the motion event for, um, for customer, um, A's um, for customer A's uh, and to the to the uh, instance for customer B that's not right. So it needs to correlate, you know, the event A and event B correctly in order to do the right processing and produce the right result. So this is a um, any question on this? Okay. So um, if there is a door open event or other smoke detection event, all these and all need to correct to correctly. And there must be some identity information there to help the event consumer to correlate them. Um, so this is another uh, use case, it's long application use case. So we have two events here. Event A means that uh, the user submit a long application and event B means that application is approved by some 
managed or by some banking system. Again, similarly, there could be many event A and event B. So when the event receiver gets that event, gets, get, gets these events, they need to know how to map them to the correct you know, processing unit, processing instance. And the third use case is streaming video use case. So for example, when someone upload an image file, it needs to be transmitted, to, uh, a video file, it needs to transmit it to different uh, end user. And then the end user's um, uh, display could in different, might be, might receive, might might be able to understand different format. For example, some will understand MPEG format, some will understand the HLS format, and other will understand the dash format. So when that event A happens, which means the video file is uploaded to some storage, then it needs to you know, do different transcoding. And then each transcoding completion time could be different. So event B means the MPEG transcoding is completed, and event C means the HLS transcoding is completed, and even D means um, the uh, dash transcoding is completed. Again, when the event receiver received all these different events, it also need to correlate, you know, the event A to the right event B, event C, and event D, and to do the processing. So this example is about travel um, employee travel application use case. So event A is a travel application and event B is a travel approval. Uh, similarly, when the event, there could be many travel uh, uh, requests and approval events. So when the event receiver gets all these events, you need to do the right, um, to correlate the event A to the, uh, to the event, correct event B. So in summary, um, we can see that there are, um, it could be many such use cases, you know, smart home, you know, any smart home use cases from the finance, you know, um, department, like, you know, the stock trade, you have buy, you have sell, you are going to have, you know, um, the validation and, uh, you know, when you want to sell, uh, sell stock, it needs to do a validation. And then when that validation returns result, that's another event. Um, um, so it need to map to the right uh, stock sale. Um, request. And then there are like, you know, healthcare, like, you know, some heart ECG monitoring that could trigger different events. Um, and also in education, in government, and like you know, also that like some example like chatbot that in, involves multiple events. So all these involves, um, all these use cases involve multiple events, and then we need to correlate them cor correctly. So to support such use cases, each type of the event must carry some identity uh, labels or identity attributes, whatever we call them, to distinguish the, that event from the other event instances of the same type. Like, you know, the same motion events, there could be many motion events. We need to distinguish, you know, which one it is, and then to correlate that event to the other events correctly using the uh, identity information carried in that carried inside that event message so it is the event producer's responsibility to put some identity labels in the event context attributes because if there are no such information then there's no way uh, to do the correlation sorry um so in terms of you know if like a, a producer could put some identity uh, information in the event uh, context attributes and then you know it is a service application developer's responsibility to, responsibility to specify for that service app use case or that service app workflow, um, which identity label that is carried in the event should be used to correlate it with the other events. So there are two, these are two separate steps. But I, I think first the uh, requirement is in the event message itself, the event message itself should carry some identity labels in the event context attributes. That, that's all. all right. Any questions? Yeah, two things. One, I apologize. I probably should have said something before you started, Kathy. This, the reason we're talking about this is because on previous phone calls, there's been a lot of discussion about correlation and stuff like that. And we thought it'd be useful to have some people who, um, who cared deeply about the correlation use cases to explain some of the, the driving uh, scenarios that were 
pushing them to make sure that they that these things were supported and that's why we're doing this and the other thing is kathy can you give me the url to this presentation so i'd include it in the notes oh yeah sure okay. I, I will um we need to send you now or i can send you after the meeting oh, later I send you. I, I, later i just want to make sure it's in the notes at, at some point okay sure mm -hmm. okay all right cool so any questions for kathy or comments uh, I, uh, it's Luciano from Ito. Uh, I'd like to, to add something on the cat things that uh, uh, another use case for uh, the correlation ID. Uh, and the operation uh, daily days, if I'm using a choreography microservice, uh, I can use the correlation ID to, to track and make the lineage of the events that uh, is going to start in a chain of events. So uh, I believe that is another, uh, it's more useful than, uh, than uh, was already presented. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And actually when, um, when we were done taking questions for Kathy's thing, I was gonna ask if there are other use cases that people would like to, to talk about or, or to, to uh, present. So yes. Oh yeah, I think the use cases I presented is just some um, simplified real um, scenarios that try to illustrate the need for the correlation. It's, there are many other use cases. This is just a, some, you know, some example, some simple example. I have one comment. We, we had this, um, uh, the open tracing that open tracing, I, I forget what the names of these things are, um, a specification uh, where I think what you presented here, all the use cases where effectively it's a application level concern and not necessarily a infrastructure concern. We have these cross-cutting scenarios where um, you have these tracing things which are effectively injected by the middleware and then carried in the event and then evaluated by some other middleware. Um, and and I'm just, I just want to point out that the correlation mechanism is good for that as well. Um, and then for those, we also need to have correlation information that's likely different from the correlation information that's being put into the event by the publisher um, that can then also be carried. And of course, that can also be carried as extensions um, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the envelope level. Yeah, and it, hey, this is Jim. I had a similar comment. I know I'd be a bit leery if you were conflating um, distributed tracing um, with event correlation, because I think they're slightly different. I mean, one is you know, diagnostic and, and all that sort of thing, and the other is really business process uh, monitoring so, or control. So, you know, clearly indicating when you should use one versus the other, I, I think would be a good statement to make. Yeah. And, and I believe, I believe if I may, may comment on that, um, that having uh, these, the, the model that we're, that we've been starting with, where, you know, if you look at the extensions, the few extensions that we already have, um, where you can basically define an extension for um, uh, open tracing, and then you could also define an extension for a particular smart home consortium and they can all exist in parallel and everybody kind of just, you know, picks, picks out the metadata that they need. Um, and uh, the, the, the metadata is really defined for scope use cases. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I, and, I, and I guess my concern is that um, if you look at open tracing, I'm sorry to come back to that one again. Um, you know, I believe that body defines how their uh, properties are propagated across different transports. Yeah, so you get this sort of contention between, you know, if I'm sending a cloud event over HTTP, do I put the open tracing attributes in the HTTP headers as defined by open tracing, or do you put them inside the cloud event extensions as potentially, you know, uh, described by the cloud events group. So, uh, but but my question was more around, or my comment was more around, clearly separating um, diagnostic tracing, which is what I view open tracing as, versus business process 
monitoring or control, which is what I think event correlation is. Yeah, you're trying to group events together to, to form some sort of logical um, unit. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree with this comment. I think this one is more um, for the um, for the use in the business logic, how to correlate, correlate one event, uh, one event to the other event. In the case, you know, if there are multiple event instances of each type. And also I believe the information, that, that oh, go ahead. Sorry. The information. Sorry, uh, the information usually, you know, originated from the um, by uh, usually should should be put in by the event producer, um, not you know the um, the intermediate routers. Of course, the intermediate router can add more you know um, information or more labels, but you know the regional um, the information um, used for correlation will come originally from the um, from the event producer or event um, how to say it the the, the the event you know the the, the event source that that uh, sent out originally sent out this event so I guess that raises another question and uh, maybe related to um, apologize I can't remember the guy's name that was talking earlier um, about you know where is it the consortia's sort of um, view on how stuff should be correlated and does that go in their extension um, and and is it possible to sort of generalize this pattern and elevate it up uh, because in your example of a, a home you know security system I would imagine that those devices are emitting source information and that the the security company or whatever is correlating those together and saying, oh, that's going on in this building. Yeah, so it's, they would be decorating the event to sort of allow downstream consumers to then, you know, correlate that stuff more explicitly, for instance. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good question. So that's why, um, so uh, here is, so in the, the event producer will put some identity information in the event context attributes. And then you know, it is the event application developer, which, you know, developed the, that motion, uh, that you know, burglary and detection uh, security system. It's that developer, you know, because he knows, you know, how many other events are involved in that security um, application and that in his um, secure in his security uh, application workflow he need to specify say on um, what event uh, what identity label in the motion event uh, should be used for the correlation and which identity label in the um, window open event should be used for the correlation for example for that um, motion uh, application, uh, the, the well, not motion, sorry, in that security application use case, and you know, when it transferred to service, uh, a service uh, uh, implementation, it's going to, uh, uh, it, it will specify in the service applications, service security application workflows back that, you know, um, the, the correlation label might be uh, like a home address, something like that. Yeah, for the um, for the time. Yeah. The, the way the, the way the way how I imagine that is that so for the so you have this alert the window is open and there's a home automation specific island of data that's the effectively that's the correlation for the home automation app that's probably even defined by a consortium which says. This sensor is in is the, the third window in this room on this floor in this building on this campus. And then there is another data island, which has nothing to do with that. It's, it's mostly orthogonal to it, which says the causality ID is this, and that's something that a tracing particular tracing framework understands. So you can go and take one event, you can populate it with metadata that's understood by separate different consumers 
and you can go and have the home automation application correlate and know where that sensor is. You can have the tracing application know, um, correlate all the causality IDs. You can, so it's like different modules can go and pick different stuff from, from that particular event. And you can even, if you want to support multiple different tra tracing frameworks, because building these, things, building these things seems to be popular these days, um, you could probably go and, and, and feed metadata required for one or two or three of them um, into the same event, but have them separate. So, so it seems to me though that the net of this is though, uh, the net of this is to just make sure that whatever we produce has the flexibility to not only just support all these use cases that you guys are talking about, but the ability to put the required information into a cloud event so that the use cases can then be possible, right? I mean, that's basically the net of all of this, right? Yeah, yeah. I I think the the key point, no matter how, so there are two. This you know, how it this um this information is used. That's another issue. But right. they all comes to the key point that in the cloud event we must uh, put some the event producer must put some um, identity attributes in there so that you know whatever the application on um, the event consumer application on um, you how the the event consumer application use it. The, they have their way of defining, you know, which label should be used or which combination of the um, identity information that should be used for the correlation or for the tracing or for other purpose. Mm -hmm. But bottom line is we need to have those information in the event context attributes. Otherwise, those use cases, these use cases will not be supported. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Can, so I think we are concentrating about... for the event this Sorry, for the event discussion, we're concentrating on number three. I do not know why, you know, there's always a pretty, please move this window away from the share. I, what I have that? no idea. I've never seen that before. That's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit weird. I do not know why. Yeah, it's a kind of, it's block. Okay, anyway. Yeah, okay. I think number three is, you know, what we, the summary, the key summary here. Number four is a separate thing, you know, it's like how from the event um, consumer point of view or the service application point of application point of view, how they should use this information. But you but numbers the number three is, you know, is the key point for the from cloud events point of view. We need to have some it needs to have some identity information in the context attributes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. There someone, yeah, was, there, was there someone else that got to say something in there before Kathy started talking? I was I was curious why it is that this is it's important for these these identity labels that uh, as far as I can tell are are purely meaningful within the application context to be a part of the context attributes as opposed to something like the payload. Um, and, uh, when you were you were showing the diagrams earlier, maybe you could uh, switch to one. There was a, uh, a event receiver, and and it appeared to the, me that the event receiver is owned by the serverless application itself. And and that um, that means that it would be uh, uh, how to how to express this well um, maybe maybe to come at it from the different point of view I, if if that event receiver was an infrastructural component that needed to make a decision about how to say parti uh, which partition of a of a sharded system to send the event to then then uh, an ID that would help make that decision seems like it would be something that would be important for the envelope but for something that is uh, entirely within the applications domain and and definition and model of existence that it, it seems like perhaps uh, elevating that into the context context attributes is maybe less uh, important yeah I would agree and it seems like at that point the event producer or I'm sorry the person or I'm sorry, the component that's adding these attributes or making the decision about whether to add the attributes almost has to know whether the receiver that's going to process that information is part of quote as you said the application versus infrastructure and base and, and use that information to determine whether it's okay to keep it in the payload versus in the envelope. So so my understanding is different. I think what what one of you guys said is the event consumer is part of the application context. I actually think it's part of the infrastructure context. It, I think it's the infrastructure that will have to look at the correlation and then basically route that event to the appropriate serverless function or the serverless instance that's going to service it. 
Am I right, Cathy? Is it the application context? I assume the event consumer is going to be in the infrastructure context, right? The point at which the routing based yeah. on the correlation labels happens. Yes, yes, you are right. right. It's, right. In the, it's in the infrastructure context. You know, it needs to decide which, would that, you know, application is. Would that look like having a specific function that a event should be sent to if it's from a specific house or, or location in a security system? Or, or what, what does that mean in the real world, I guess, is my question. Is this an event gateway? And which one? Uh, sorry, your question again? Uh, is the event consumer more of an event gateway? Um, or is it actually going into the payload and doing, say, more than an event gateway? It's more than event gateway. It's not intermediate routing gateway. Uh, it's more like an uh, event uh, a uh, consumer, you know, when the event, uh, it's a, like an a infrastructure co component that receives this event, which, you know, it has to process this event and then parse it to get that information, that event, all the event uh, metadata or context attributes. And then from those information, it decide how to, you know, and send the event to which um, um, application instance. So I, I'm, I'm, trying to figure, I'm trying to figure out the way, next... You know, I, Go ahead, Kathy, sorry. It depends on how you... Sorry, I think you can... It depends how you define this event gateway. You can say it, whatever the name, but the functionality is, you know, it will pass, it will pass all the context attributes and then from those informations and decide how to, you know, how to set... From the, from the correlation point of view, it's going to get that uh, identity information and then decide and you know which you know which application instant to send that event. So, so it seems to me that this is getting into a discussion about uh, possible text that we need to add someplace, whether it's into our spec or into the primer, that talks about when things should go into the payload versus the envelope. And Kathy's opened up a pull request to start that that discussion and, and put up some proposed text. I'm wondering if it makes sense to defer uh, the rest of this discussion or around that part of it anyway, to Kathy's PR. Does that make any sense? Or do you guys think like, that's important to have that discussion right now? I would believe that it might be something you might want to defer having done all of those use cases other than the video where the correlation ID was absolutely required and important. It was only one of several um, factors that were in the either payload or in the protocol headers that were used to actually do the actual correlations. So using just a correlation ID may not be enough. You may need to have like a map or some other series of IDs as opposed to just one or else these applications are not going to work with just one. At least that's what we found in three of those four use cases. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I don't think, you know, um, there will be just one um, label called correlation ID. It's not that case. I think it's, uh, you know, the, it could be, you know, um, one event's uh, identity information could map to another event's uh, another identity information. So it might not be one, yeah. But I think I want to separate, you know, um, the two things. One thing is what the event producer what information the event producer put into the events, what identity information the event producer put into the event. And another thing is, you know, how the different, uh, you know, um, for different use cases, right? Um, how they specify in the, on the receiver side, how they specify which identity and label in the context attribute to be used to do the correlation. These are two different things. I think in the, from the cloud events point of view, we just concentrate on the first thing. Um, so how we should put on the, I think that the whole presentation purpose is to just to um, illustrate why we need this uh, uh, identity label information in the events um, to support. I think the, the goal is to support such use cases and there are many such use cases. Right. 
So with that, um, I think Kathy's part of the presentation is done. Are there other people on the call who would like to present their use cases that they feel like fundamentally uh, add new information to the discussion? I'm here. Okay. I represent Itaú. Luciano had to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, if but uh, I'm to... still here, but I'm still here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one, I'm not sure if the use case were said, but on our, our perspective, the correlation ID was meant to uh, segment little business events that together represent a much more abstract business event. For example, in our case, we work in a financial company and for a transaction, put it simply, would be a, a debit from one account and a credit into another. That would be two different events, but the second one would need a reference from the first one to encapsulate the whole transaction. So that would be a use case for our scenario. Okay, makes sense. Uh, I would just add uh, that uh, in our scenario, uh, probably most of the events will be asynchronous. So it's the reason that we must have some kind of uh, connection between them. All right, makes sense. Anything else? All right, cool. Uh, I, would, uh, I have a question. Vlad here. Uh, is there a concern that the identity information might be too big? Uh, in Kathy's presentation, there was a line that uh, each event must identify itself. What if the event wants to use certificates? Might they be way too big in size? This is uh, related to the concerns that this uh, info might be better in the event payload. Any comments on that one? So, oh, okay, so, so your, your question is whether the um, identity information is too big um, uh, uh, I just I just send the info from the event itself. Uh, maybe uh, uh, alternative option from the what Katy present. I just uh, send uh, the uh, ID from the original event on the on the metadata, and then I can recreate it, everything from a event store. I don't know. It's something that we are discussing. It's an option. Uh, and I can envelope on the extensions all the other information if uh, we'll get better performance to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are. So your point is you put this identity information in the envelope in the I mean in the context attributes, right? Not in the payload. Is that what you mean? So for better performance. Yes. Yes, yeah, and I but I. But I would make a, a explicit uh, the uh, correlation ID or the casualty ID. I don't know what's the best name to it. But uh, for the chain of events that we want to map uh, and have the lineage the traceability, I would please have a, an attribute for that. Okay. Uh, so you can, the problem is that your, causa your causality that you care about for your use case may not be the same causality that someone else cares about for their use case. So we have all these frameworks, all, we talked about all these tracing frameworks. They all have their own idea of you know, what tracing is and how correlation works. And then you have on the same event, a framework that cares about that event from a, a device management perspective. And you have another framework or application that cares about that event from a home automation perspective. And so you have now three competing contexts of what the correlation context means. And so having a single ID is not going to satisfy the needs for, of any of these three contexts. Yeah, I'll second that. That was my same concern. This is very virtual. Yeah, yeah. Right. I do think a single ID will work. Yeah. I think, you know, the could, different event producer could put different um, identity information there. 
So the, what what are these identity information? That's up to the um, that that's you know we cannot predict because there are so many different types of events, right? But they but I think the the common point is no matter what kind of application or use cases, the common point is the event producer need to put some information in the context attributes that you know the application or whatever um, uh, tracing or whatever they can use to do their own specific correlation um, purpose. Um, that's, and, the, and I think this information, as, as, as I think one gentleman mentioned, is you know, these identity information um, should be put into the context attribute field for better performance instead of, you know, the event consumer has to pass a big payload to get that information. That, that's my that's my uh, that my point. Okay, and Kathy, before I forget, I'm assuming that when your charts say Huawei confidential, that's just a typo, and that will be removed before you share those. Sorry, sorry say it again. Your presentation at the very bottom said Huawei confidential. I'm assuming that's just a typo, and that will be removed before you share those. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Just wanted to get that out there. Okay. I just copied the template, so. Yeah, that, that's okay. what I figured. That's why, that's why I called it a typo, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other points on this topic? As I said, I, I, if it's not clear, this obviously isn't the only time we can talk about this. I just, my preference, though, going forward is to talk about uh, correlation or identity or whatever within the context of a pull request that people want to see, you know, a change to the spec. I think it's easier to, to have that discussion rather than the abstract one. But at the same time, uh, this, this conversation did come up enough times that we thought it'd be useful to have the abstract discussion at least once more uh, in one of our calls, which is why we're doing it now. But going forward, please, let, let's, talk, let's try to work these things through PRs and talk about you know, changes people want to see in spec. That'll, that'll help focus the discussions. All right, with that, <clears throat> um, what I'd like to do is talk about Sarah's PR. Now, Rachel, are you able to talk to this one from Sarah since I don't believe she's on the call? This was about the change about qualifying projects. Um, yeah, yeah, I can talk about this. Okay, I think that's, so those are just things. I think the bulk of it is right in this section right here, pretty much. Did Everything you else. have an outstanding comment on this PR that hadn't been? There received? was, I, th I think Clemens had one just this morning here. And that's why I wanted to talk about this one because this, this, this PR is kind of blocking for some other ones. So I thought it'd be good to have that discussion now if possible. So um, I like maybe the right way to handle this one is to summarize the conversation that you and Clemens and I had with Brian because I think that impacts us. Okay, you want to summarize that one? I'd be happy for you too. <laughs> um, okay, um, so let's see. There are lots of different things we talked about. So. As a result of the protobuf PR, um, Clemens, Brian Grant from Google, Rachel and myself had a conversation yesterday. Um, let's see if I can remember everything we talked about. So first off, there was some potential legal governance, whatever you want to call it, concerns around the protobuf protocol itself. And uh, those discussions will or will not happen outside of our project here, meaning outside of cloud events, because that's not really for us to decide here whether Proto stays where it is, goes to some other foundation or something like that. We don't know, we don't care. It doesn't really impact us directly. That's a different conversation. Our, our project though um, can decide on our own whether we want to adopt, use, reference, whatever, any particular protocol, regardless of the governance model. For the most part, we can choose to do whatever we want. It's up to us to decide. So we have our own destiny in our own hands for the most part, within the, within the scope of whatever CNCF rules are, are binding us. Um, so relative to the proto discussion itself, we will decide on our own whether we like that PR or not on our own. Uh, governance, legal reasons are not gonna really impact us unless someone chooses to let that impact their vote. But as a group, uh, it has no impact on us. Uh, the other thing I think we talked about, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Rachel, because I want to make sure I get this right, is that we're going to be looking for the PR to change slightly to focus more on just the binary representation of proto, a proto 
and not necessarily the, the JSON representation. Do I have that right? To be clear, we're not talking about this PR, we're talking about Spencer's protobuf proposal. Correct, the 295, I, th I think, is the number, yes. Right. Right, okay. Um, and so that, that's about that PR. Now, the reason I think this ties back into this one, Rachel, I think the reason you wanted to mention here was because you guys were then looking for changes to this PR that loosened it a little to talk about how uh, protocols or bindings could come from places other than uh, consortia, basically. So it could come from, or, um, I, I guess, what was the word that we used before? Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, instead of just multi-company consortia, you basically wanted to open it up to just ecosystems in general, as opposed to just formal consortia like Oasis and stuff like that. Is that correct? I think the phrase that we used when we talked about this, but wasn't captured in when we when we wrote the words down, was de facto like widespread de facto standards, where it's not a standard, but it has wide use. That was the thing that we're trying to capture. Right. Okay. So with that, Clemens, would you like to address your concern that you raised with the change in the wording? Uh, yeah, so the, the, if you just look at the change as it is, it looks like a type of correction, um, but it really just dramatically changes the semantics of, of that particular sentence. So here, let me, let me um, show the sentence. Hold on. Yeah. So I believe it's the change of the or in here. Yeah, so, it, it, it was of yeah, if, and now it's an or. Yeah, so if you, if you, if you go to uh, view the entire document, it's probably easier to read if you go there. Yeah, it's, it's, I brought it up. Um, no, 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 no. But this only shows the. Oh, okay. So some widely used protocols. Basically, what this what this was intending to do is just introduces the notion that there are protocols which we could, should consider that are de facto standards. And so what this said, some widely used protocols have become de facto standards emerging out of strong ecosystems of top level multi company consortia projects. And now with that change where it says or, it's basically breaking that term, strong ecosystems of top level multi-company consortia projects apart into two terms, losing the, the previous ones, right? And that's, and that's, for me, that's a little odd. What it appears to be doing is, is saying, uh, there are strong ecosystems which are not the prior, prior one, and then and then there's the other ones which are top level multi company consortia projects. And so what I proposed was basically in in my comment was basically teasing those things apart because I, I don't think it's like it, it seems like it seems a little odd to go make a make a correction where you where you you know break apart a term in a sentence where you change or to off to or, but rather really go and be explicit about the intent of what you do. So that's what I'm, what I'm proposing here because the, the, the juxtaposition here to make is really, there's top level multi-company consortia projects and the other ones are um, proprietary projects. So it sounds like you're not objecting to <clears throat> the, the desired semantic change. It was more of a syntactical thing that concerned you. Yeah, I'm, it's just that there's a there has been a um, it, it, there's a semantic change that breaks apart the, the statement that is being made, and instead of breaking that apart, it would be good to go and just add a a part a sentence a, or a part of the sentence that clarifies what the change in sentence because that's what it seems to be. Okay. So we didn't think that we were making a typo change. We thought that we were changing the meaning of it. It is a semantic difference, and we think this is a better one. Just no, no, I'm sorry, to Rachel, just to be clear. What I meant was Clemens wasn't disagreeing with your semantic change. He was, I, I was interpreting his thing as more of a syntactical change on top of your semantic change. That, that's what I meant. I, I understand you're looking for a semantic change. I apologize if I wasn't clear. Uh, you were, they were making an addition, or their intent was to make an addition, and I think I, I just made that addition more explicit, uh, because the, the, it was, basically the, the term strong ecosystems of proprietary projects, uh, sorry, strong ecosystems 
of a couple of multi-company consortium projects was broken apart, and that's one firm. So, Rachel, do you think, I know you probably need, you guys probably need some time to think about this, and you probably need to have Sarah look at it since this was, this was originally her PR, but in general, do you think this, this type of change that Clement is talking about here is something that is still consistent with the goal of what your PR was trying to do? Yeah, we can address Clement's concerns. Okay. Okay. In that case, let me turn the, let me switch this discussion around then from Clemens question. Um, for anybody else on the call, are there other concerns with the change in this PR? Okay, because I'd like to see if we can resolve this uh, you know, by next week's phone call. And, Just uh, to be clear, like the point of this was that we wanted to make sure, like the motivation for this is that we want to make sure that this is applicable to many different projects. That's why we were doing this. We, wanna, we wanted to broaden what we see as like people that we welcome to uh, join this community. Like who, who are we making this spec for? We want to like make that a broader tent. That's, that's the motivation behind this. Yep, I think, that, I think that's clear. So I, I think here is a top level multi-company. Do we need to define what that multi company, how many is considered like multi company? I think there's there are comments say, you know, if we can be more explicit, that we more objective rather than, you know, um, if we can define that, I think it will be better. Like five or 10 or, or three. Rachel, any comment on that one? I guess my, well, this is not my PR, this is Sarah's, but if I were to give my opinion about this, it would be um, if there are two companies that are collaborating in the open on, on a project, then I would consider that multi-company. But um, if people would like to see broader, like we, we, the, the expectation is that there is strong community support behind whatever is happening. Uh, so I wouldn't want to make any of these like, necessary clauses i want to like i want to see like the overall like um a whole system of indicators showing that there has their support behind this yeah it's funny because the entire purpose of some of the discussions we had around this text in the in the document or in the, in the working group is because people want a little more clarity on how to how to measure these things right they didn't want to be quite so subjective um, and that's a challenge. <laughs> so maybe you could talk to Sarah and see if there's some sort of additional will, wording. Well, I think but, if people have specific concerns, the best, like if you leave those comments then Sarah will see them. Yeah, that's true. So Kathy, can you put a comment into the PR about your concern about the use of the word top level? Yeah, okay, I can put that in, thank you. Okay, yeah, then Sarah will see it and, and hopefully take a look at it. Okay. Any other concerns or questions about this PR? Uh, this is Ryan. Um, hey Ryan. From what I understand now is this top level multi-company uh, consorted doesn't seem to even mean anything now because um, this is all. So it seems like all we need to say is it's a uh, have as strong as, as Rachel mentioned, it's basically what we need is someone has uh, something that actually has a strong ecosystem and has a wide community support. And looks like whether it's coming out of multi company or single company, doesn't matter. It, it will meet the bar anyway. That's that's my, I'll leave the comment there. That's That's my thinking now. Looks like that's with this or whatever the semantic change the second part doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, if you can leave a comment in there and at this, and this, and this actually applies to both you, Ryan, and as well as Kathy, if you guys could propose some alternate text to try to not just, to, to, to basically try to clarify the points, I think that'd be useful. Um, yeah, that, sure. would, that, would, yeah. that would help, that would help Sarah, you know, get some clarity about uh, what you're looking for to, to, to clean this thing up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the okay. uh, to just to be clear, looks like the original intent was really only confine those 
protocols with top level. Now with this all, the confined the the restriction pretty much is gone. Then, yeah. Anyway, I, I'll leave comment there. Yeah, I think that'd be best because I like to get Sarah's in, input on this. Obviously. All right. Anything else? We're almost out of time. Okay. Uh, let me just double check it on. So there is a new PR that Kathy opened up. I wanted to draw people's attention to in, in 30 seconds. 301. Um, hey, this hey, one, Doug, I'm sorry, yes. Austin. This hey, is Austin, yeah. I'd love to just speak to the SDK too real quick, um, but I could do that right after you you go over that PR. Okay, yeah, I'll be quick. Um, basically, I just want to draw people's attention to this PR um, that Kathy opened because I'd like to get some eyes on it sooner rather than later. Um, it talks about um, the notion of of including identity properties for either correlation or identity purpose or something into the message itself. And like I said, starts that process of, of opening up the discussion about when things go into the payload versus into the cloud event attributes and stuff like that. So I think this is gonna be a critical one for us to get right going forward. Uh, so please, when you get a chance, take a look at it. Um, I think it's gonna be an important one. And that's 301. And with that, Austin, go ahead and mention the SDK stuff. Austin, you still there? Yeah, just there we go. with the mute, mute button. Um, hi, everyone. I, we, we came to a conclusion on the extensions work, and I think now is time to is a great time to focus on the SDKs. Um, so we'd love to kick off that effort again. I'll send out a doodle poll later tonight, and if anyone is interested in contributing to the SDK efforts, um, just look out for that. I'll post it in the Slack channels as well as the CNCF uh, message board. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. I assumed you were going to do that. So that's what I mentioned earlier, but thank you for, for confirming it. So All right. Now, yeah, now, go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. Now I would like to just one, one pump. So the reason the pull the new PR is so the original PR we, uh, is, is proposed uh, uh, identity label um, bag, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there uh, that looks like, I'm not sure whether the people would like to go for that or go for this new one. So yeah, you can take a look, you know, this one we didn't, you know, we, there's no, identity label bag proposed. Basically, you know, the producer can just put whatever uh, identity labels um, or identity Kathy, labels. Kathy, it's, Kathy, it's in your power to retract the, the other one because it's yours. Yes, yeah, so you can, you can so, close so the other one if you want, Kathy. I think in the next meeting, I would like people to vote to say, you know, which way is better. Okay, well, we're, over, we're technically over time, so we'll have that discussion next week then. So let me just quickly get the roll call for people who are late. Um, Christoph, you, you still there? Yes, I'm still there. Okay, Doug, are you there? Doug? Uh, Joe Sherman? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, Luciana, I heard. Jem, I heard. Uh, P. Birch, I don't, I couldn't catch your first name. I think I heard him though, Rohit? What about Alex Debris? Yep, here. And Matt Rakowski? Here, Doug. Okay. Um, Marcelio? Marcelo? Yeah, it's me. And then you're I'm from here. Itop? I'm, I'm from Itaú, too. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, Austin, I heard. Uh, Christian from Itaú? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Rove? Vero V? Okay, what about Doug? Are you there? Okay, is there anybody I missed? And I got Doug, yeah, I got you through chat. Sorry about that, I forgot. Anybody I miss? All right, cool, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it, and I apologize for running slightly over time. We'll talk again next week. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.